Hello, and welcome to Associated University, a group that is designed to provide supply chain management professionals with access to information on practical solutions concerning the industry's current hot topics. Today, we will be discussing the dark side of e-commerce, otherwise known as reverse logistics, including approaches that retailers are exploring to address the return processing costs by still providing the best customer experience. For today's webinar, we are honored to have Troy Donnelly, who currently serves as Vice President of Integration for Toyota Advanced Logistics. Prior to joining Toyota Advanced Logistics, Troy served as Director of Solution Design for HK Logistics, Project Director for Peach State Integrated Technologies, and the Director of Consulting and Systems Integration for Associated. Troy earned a Bachelor's of Science degree in Industrial Engineering from the Milwaukee School of Engineering and a Master of Business Administration degree from Marquette University. He also served in the Marine Corps prior to getting his advanced degrees. Throughout Troy's career, he simulated and designed numerous systems across multiple industries, including a $100 million project and a $110 million service contract. In addition, he has leveraged his system analyst approach to lead the evaluation of equipment for research and development initiative. And now I will pass it over to Troy to get us started. Thank you, Sherry. As we go through look at the agenda today, <clears throat> what I'd like to cover is how e-commerce has really changed shopping really in ways that we did not initially predict. And with that has come the dark side of e-commerce and that being returns. With myself being part of the Toyota organization, we are always kind of focusing and looking at waste and how to reduce it. So I want to look at well, as well at what are the components of returns that result in waste and then what are some of the ways that the industry is looking at battling that waste. So with that, um, we'll start at the beginning here of how shopping has changed with e-commerce. Uh, I think when e-commerce first came onto the market, many people had the perception that, all right, people are going to be buying things online, having them delivered at home, and really just kind of a, a transference of the same model uh, was the assumption that versus me going to a store and buying something and bring it home, now I'm going to order it on my computer and bring it home. I think what we've actually found is by buying things online, it's changed the way that people shop now. And a lot of it has to do with you're not physically there, that many people are, are, are buying what they might want or they're buying multiple things and potentially returning them because it's so convenient. That the, the way people shop is completely changed. Um, and again, with that has come the returns. And you see here really a lot of the impacts and specifically with returns, it reflects how people have changed how they shop. That with bricks and mortar, the returns are typically you know, right close to 9%. But when it comes to e-commerce, you end up seeing returns that are three and four times higher uh, for e-commerce returns. So with that, when we look at returns, um, I guess I want to pose the question. What do you think is the most common reason for returns? And we have a poll question here uh, that uh, everyone can kind of chime in and, and provide their feedback. Is it, is it the wrong item? Is it a damaged item? Is it doesn't meet expectations? Or is it some other reason? Uh, might be uh, wardrobing, which I'll, I'll mention here in, in a little bit. And wardrobing, if people aren't aware, is when people buy an item, wear the item, and then return it. You know, so it starts to get into a little bit more of what I'll call a, a fraudulent return, where the return um, really isn't a result of anything that the uh, retailer has done. It's a result of expectations of the, of the individual. So I think what we've, what we've seen here is that the majority of people feel that the, the largest, the most common reason for a return is the item doesn't meet expectations. So let's see what, uh, what it turns out to be. So here is what you know, the industry has seen. 
that it's pretty even across the board. Uh, receiving damaged product, uh, product being received looks different. And I think that again gets into the expectations. And about you know 22% is the product doesn't look like I expected it to. And then 23% being received the wrong item. And then you know you got a kind of a catch-all there uh, for other reasons, which many times gets into a lot of fraudulent activities, being the wardrobe being in, and things of that nature. Now the interesting thing I think to look at here is how many of these things are avoided when you look at a bricks and mortar purchase? Uh, well, number one, you're not gonna have, typically you may not have damaged product because you're gonna be able to inspect that product when you purchase it. It's not gonna look different because again, you are there physically identifying what it is and making sure it fits or, or again, meets your expectations. And it's not gonna be the wrong product as well because you're physically there. So what we're really identifying is kind of all of the reasons for the returns or the increase in returns when it comes to e-commerce. The other thing that I think this points out, especially when it comes to receiving damaged product or receiving a wrong item, is many, you know, a lot, you know, we have progressed a lot through the years but especially initially, the distribution networks were not set up for e-commerce. They were set up for supporting store orders. And a customer wouldn't see if a distribution center set the, sent the wrong pallet to a store, they, they wouldn't recognize uh, that kind of quality issue. In addition, the distribution centers as I mentioned, they were sending full pallet quantities or case quantities or, or layer quantities, but now they're being forced to do order filling, which they didn't necessarily have the processes in place, processes and procedures in place to do that, which has created a challenge. Um, and they're, they're continuing to adapt to overcome some of these reasons for returns being specific to uh, receiving damaged product or receiving the wrong item. So now let's look at the waste that is a result of returns. And one of the big ones, kind of right off the bat, is the original order. All of that time and effort to process an original order where an item is returned is all waste. And where you can really see this emphasized is when you have people, and my wife is one of them, who would buy multiple of the same item, let's say different sizes or different colors, and they know when they, when they purchase it that they're gonna end up returning you know, anything that doesn't fit or, or isn't the color they're looking for. They're really kind of bringing the shopping experience home by ordering everything they wanna look at and returning everything. So those orders, you know, many times the retailer will know upfront Okay, someone's ordering uh, three of the same item, different sizes, two of those are gonna be returned. And, and therefore, the order filling of those two items is waste. And then you get into the returns processing. You know, you're now receiving a single item, you're unpacking it, you're inspecting it, you're potentially repackaging it, and then you have to either restock it, recl reclassify it, dispose of it. All of that, of course, is waste on that return as well. The unique thing with the returns processing is, again, for a distribution center, this is a is a unique uh, a unique way to receive. Many times, things are of course received. A lot of the same processes are the same for receiving new items, except you're receiving a full pallet quantity. Now you're receiving a single item and having to do a lot of those same steps. Previously again, in a bricks and mortar model, returns processing really wasn't that significant for a distribution center. But now with e-commerce, it is becoming much more prominent. And the, and the distribution centers are having to adapt to that increased number of returns. So now we have our next poll question. You know, we, we've talked a lot about uh, returns here already and a lot about e-commerce. 
So now the, you know, one of the big questions everyone or one of the assumptions everyone has when it comes to e-commerce is, okay, what's the most profitable model? So that's the question I, I want to pose here. What do you believe is the most profitable sale for a retailer? Is it selling in a traditional brick and mortar? Is it selling online and, and shipping to your house? Is it selling online and picking up in the store? Or is it selling online and shipping from the store? You know, as we've seen omni-channel here continue to uh, become prevalent and, and adapt uh, through, through the years, we've seen a lot of these different models increase in popularity. You know, all with kind of two venues. One is, I think, an assumption on uh, trying to reduce cost. The other one is, of course, trying to make things convenient uh, for the consumer. So it appears that what, uh, what our audience here believes the most profitable for a retailer would be to sell online and pick up at the store, uh, with the second being just selling online in general. Um, then brick and mortar and, and bringing up the rear uh, is online ship from the store. So let's see what uh, what the industry actually says. So what the industry has found is the most profitable is actually purchasing things in a store for the retailer. And that <clears throat> I think one of the fundamental reasons that that is the case is that is also historically what the distribution networks were made for and set up for. So when you look at it from that standpoint, it kind of makes sense that, okay, the infrastructure in place has been set up to send things to a store and for the customer to do the order filling on their own. And, and with that, it, it is still the most profitable model for retailers. The second being buying online. Uh, and the reason that buying online is not as profitable as potentially in a brick and mortar is you now have additional handling within the distribution center that you have order fillers basically acting like the customer to pick a specific order and there's labor, labor tied to that. And then in addition, you also have the home delivery shipping costs. Now, all of these, as I go through here, uh, the profitability of each of these different business models, none of these include the impact of returns. So when you factor in the impact of returns, that really magnifies the profitability of buying in the store. So this is just straight up uh, not including returns and not including how expensive it is to do returns uh, online versus in store. So I would say this is a very conservative way to look at profitability. The next one is buying online and doing in-store pickup. Now we all look at that, I mean, that, that's pretty convenient because now, okay, you're, you're able to find what you want online, make sure the store has it, and then go pick it up. So you're getting it pretty quickly as well. But when it comes to profitability for the retailer, they're now doing that in-store order filling for you. In addition, they're bearing the overhead cost of both channels. They're bearing the cost of having a, a distribution center network, uh, being able to facilitate the online ordering, and still maintaining an in-store presence uh, to handle the in-store pickup. And then lastly, we have here online uh, ship from the store. Now when we ship from the store, we still have that additional cost of order filling within the store, and then we have the shipping cost to ship the merchandise to the store and then ship it from the store to the customer. So all these things just you know continue to add up. You know, hopefully I would see, you know, hopefully the model will uh, adapt and, and, and change and, and potentially online profitability will get better. But in the current environment, in-store is still the most profitable for retailers. The other thing you'll see on this slide is that online sales still only make up 
of overall commerce. <laughs> but, it, but, but it makes up 92% of the conversation. And I think the reason it makes up so much of the conversation is just an acknowledgement that it will continue to grow. That while it's only 8% today, I think everyone fully anticipates uh, it will continue to grow. And therefore, retailers want to make sure that they're ahead of that game uh, to make sure they capture that market as it shifts. So why make returns easy? You know, we've, we've identified that Jeepers, they're, they're, they're costly. Um, there's a lot of different reasons for them. Uh, you know, it uh, online isn't necessarily as profitable as in-store. Now we've we've stated that okay we think online is going to continue to increase, but then why make returns easy? And this has to do a lot again with the shift in the model from brick and mortar to e-commerce. When you have a brick and mortar store, many times there there's few choices. You know if we if we dial the the clock back 30 years, if you're that gas station in the middle of the desert, you're going to pay whatever they're asking because you don't have an option. You don't have a choice. And a lot of times, with a lot of people, let's say in small towns, uh, retail works just like that matter. You go to the store, it may not be exactly what you want, but you're going to buy it because that's all that, that was your only choice. Now, with e-commerce, that has changed dramatically. Now, someone from anywhere in the country can buy anything they want uh, that's available online. And with that, it has made competition for those consumers much more fierce. And the the kind of the mantra that uh, online retailers have is we want to make it easy. We want to make it easy for our customers so that they keep coming back to us because we recognize how many choices they have. And when it comes to online purchases, kind of the, the term that people use is make it sticky. Make it so that the customers will keep coming back to our online store um, and we want them to keep coming back because we make it so easy for them. So that's kind of the reason why retailers have made it easy for returns um, in the past, and, and, and frankly, I think in the future as well. They're, they're, it's something that they're not, they're gonna have difficulty shifting away from. So we kind of understand that uh, why the returns happen and uh, where, we're, where we're at. Now, what, is, what are retailers and distribution uh, doing to battle the waste that is a result of returns? The first thing is trying to prevent the return to begin with. And this, of course, goes into the, the old adage of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If a retailer can avoid the return to begin with, that's, of course, going to be the the best way to go. So when we look at all those different areas on why returns happened previously, you know, the first one being damaged product, this gets into a lot of the distribution processes and procedures, and also the packaging for shipping. Um, now that retailer or distribution environments getting into order filling, they need to be concerned about the packaging that they're shipping those items to a customer to avoid that, that damaged product. One of the biggest areas that you see kind of the most work being done on is product misperception. And now you get into the data mining and predictive analytics. You know, trying to help the customer make what they're looking for. You know, you, you'll see this a lot where you may be looking for an item online, and it'll make the <clears throat> the online <clears throat> you know interface will make suggestions to you on you know these are other items that people have bought, or this may be what you're looking for. And these type of data mining predictive analytics is really a, a big advantage of, of e-commerce and online purchasing. You know, being able to provide that advice for you. Then we get into the personalization, you know, where retailers are trying to learn more about an individual to try to make those, help them make those decisions. And then visualization, you know, this is kind of uh, Star Trek-ish and, and, and very interesting. 
that there are now a, some places where you can get a 3D body scan of yourself so that you can virtually try on clothes online to make sure it looks right and, and you know, to get a feel for, all right, is this something that I'm going to like? Uh, it, it's a, definitely a, a growing market. And again, the, the intent there is to improve the customer experience and avoid the return. And then the next item there being the wrong item. Uh, that again also gets down to, to quality control and trying to improve the distribution uh, processes when it comes to order fulfillment of eaches. And then lastly, when we get into other and, and the wardrobing, you know, this is something that, uh, especially in the last couple of weeks, there's been a lot more press on in regards to retailers changing some of their returns policies to address the fraudulent returns. You know, LL Bean just came out uh, a week or so ago saying that they're now going to limit their returns to one year. Again, trying to avoid the fraudulent returns where people are purchasing an item, using the item, and then returning it. The next way that retailers are trying to address returns goes back to the omni-channel. And it's very interesting to me uh, when it comes to, to brick and mortar because you know, it wasn't so long ago that when e-commerce was really becoming prevalent, you know, people had this belief that stores are going to go away, that, uh, you know, we're never going to have physical stores anymore. Everything's going to be shipped to your house. And, and what we're finding, I think, is that there is still a practical reason for having stores. And when it comes to returns, it can be very useful for a retailer to allow customers to return items to the store. It allows them to do some initial inspection right away. It handles some of the shipping costs uh, because they can consolidate those returns. It's not a silver bullet though, because you have to recognize that whatever item is being returned, even if it's resaleable, th there's a low probability perhaps that that store needs, to, needs that item and would be stocking it right in their store. So they're still gonna be sending it back more than likely to a distribution center but they'll at least be able to consolidate that with other items to lower some of that shipping cost. The next one is the changing paradigms. And this is a, an interesting aspect on, even with all of the costs and, and headaches returns have, are they, are they really a bad thing for a retailer? And you see here that making it easy for returns, many retailers find this to be their best customers, that we, they're, they're willing to take those, that return rate because their most profitable customers are also their highest returning customers. And to try to hold on to those customers, uh, bearing that cost is not necessarily a big deal. The other aspect is, They've, a lot of retailers also find that when someone returns something, they buy something. That especially if they go to a, a brick and mortar store, it becomes a convenience. All right, I have to go to the store to return this item. And while I'm there, I'll pick up these couple things. So there becomes a, you know, we, a lot of times we get tied up with the cost aspect, but there can be some revenue generation that can result from returns as well. The next aspect when it comes to changing paradigms is packaging. And, and this is really a whole different way of looking at packaging. Historically, uh, manufacturers would package their items for in-store display. A lot of the packaging was designed exactly for that, of how are we going to present this on the aisle? You know, uh, what's it going to look like? We want to get the customer's uh, uh, attention with our packaging. When you buy things online, a lot of those benefits go away. The, the customer's buying a specific product and they don't necessarily care about the packaging. Uh, they just want the product. So now, um, does packaging matter? And do you need to put the, the anti-theft type of, type of packaging in place where you, know, you need a, a crowbar to open the item uh, when it's delivered to your home? So I think that's a different way to look at it. I don't know if the volume is high enough 
for manufacturers to change their packaging right now because a majority is still being sold in stores. So a lot of those those previous perceptions are still relevant. But I think it's something that we could definitely see changing. The other one is when it comes to, to shipping packaging. And this is something that I think everyone's experienced and is always kind of a, a little amusing of when you, you buy something and you end up getting a box in a box. And, and you say to yourself, well, why didn't they just ship it in the original box? And I think that is something that uh, manufacturers and retailers are, you know, actively looking at of can we, geez, how convenient would it be to ship the item in the same box that it's originally packaged in and, and save that uh, additional wasted space of putting it in a box plus the cost of the, the additional box for shipping. So again, I think those are items that uh, kind of reflect changing paradigms uh, when it comes to, to e-commerce. The, the last thing here is a recognition of how distribution and order filling has changed. You know, it, we originally had uh, our distribution centers handling full pilot quantities and sending those quantities to stores. Then it went to mixed pallets, whether it be by layer or, or, or case quantities. And now we've seen it go to, to an, uh, a unit item, meaning, okay, we're gonna ship a we're going to ship one directly to the customer. And, and we've seen the same thing then on returns processing. Many ways, returns processing is similar to a receiving process, but now you're only handling individual items. So now you have distribution centers that need to focus on a, a, a unit of quantity of one. Whether it's shipping or a return, you're going to deal with one item. So with that, the one technology that I've seen that you know kind of also falls into the category of everything old is new again is a pocket sorter. Uh, the unique aspect of a pocket sorter is it's using the old technology, or not not that old, but you know older technology of, of garment on hanger overhead conveyor, but you're putting you're hanging pockets from it. And what you're able to do here is kind of introduce single items, uh, convey them and to some degree store them in a very dense manner on this uh, overhead conveyor system and provide that, bring those items uniquely where you want them. Again, it, it, it's an each sorter. You know, many, many sorters out there are, are case sorters. Um, this really gets you down to an each level sorter. So it's a interesting technology that I can definitely see having much more relevance uh, when it comes to returns processing. So as we look at, at key takeaways here, um, what I would say is uh, we have a greater recognition on how e-commerce is driving different shopping habits, and it continues to change. You know, we're, the, the distribution environment is a, is a little bit uh, on, the, on the tail of this, that as e-commerce shopping habits change, they're being forced to adapt uh, to those changes. And with those changes, it's changing almost every aspect of retailers' business, uh, whether it be the, the, the omni-channel uh, business model in terms of, okay, we need to be able to, to purchase things and, and ship things and distribute things uh, in any medium, whether it be distribution or, or stores or, or whatever it may be. And then increased personalization you know, that to capture these customers, we're trying to make it as easy as possible for them, and that requires a level of personalization. And then getting into, again, some of those shifting paradigms on product packaging, shipping packaging. You know, shipping packaging, again, many years ago, when you're buying things from a brick and mortar, shipping packaging doesn't necessarily matter as much. But now with e-commerce, it's becoming very prevalent. And then with that, the returns processing. Um, trying to to address how how you handle the the increase in returns, all with a recognition that the new unit of measure for distribution is is a single item. But I, I will say, with all of that, some of the some of the most progress and some of the most attention now 
in distribution is adapting to that new unit of measure, whether it be order filling or on returns processing. Well, thank you, Troy, for presenting this material. I would also like to thank everyone who joined us today. We hope you found this information to be relevant and valuable to your organization. If you have any questions about reverse logistics strategies, please feel free to email us at info, that's I-N-F-O, at associated-solutions.com. Thank you, and have a great day.